Are you ready to thrive? As a trauma therapist, author, yoga instructor, and healed human, I personally and professionally know what it means to live stuck in survival mode. I've learned a few things in my healing journey and my career that can help you transform into your best self. Join me, Rebecca Case, as I use neuroscience, psychology, spirituality, and personal experience to help you find the tools and techniques to thrive. Hello, friends. Welcome back to Thrive the Podcast. I am your host, Rebecca Case, and today we're talking about the small but mighty vagus nerve. Why talk about the vagus nerve? The vagus nerve is perhaps one of the most important and influential nerves in your body when it comes to your mental and physical health. It is not by far the only nerve that's important for mental and physical wellness, but it is certainly an incredibly important and powerful nerve and one that's getting a lot of attention these days, especially because of a theoretical basis called polyvagal theory. Polyvagal theory is a theoretical framework that was developed by the brilliant Stephen Porges and describes the functioning of the vagus nerve as it regulates your autonomic nervous system. Oh my gosh, Rebecca, you just said a whole lot of scientific mumbo jumbo. Please break it down or I'm going to turn off this podcast now. All right. Yes. Let's talk about the vagus nerve, why it matters and how you can work with it in a way that is going to support your efforts to thrive and live your best life. So here we go. The vagus nerve, vagus stands for wanderer. And I think of this nerve as your wanderlust nerve. Why is that, you may ask? Because this nerve gets around in your body. It travels to a whole lot of places. It innervates a number of places of your body, including organs and facial muscles and lots of different Lots of different places. So it's called the wanderlust nerve, the vagabond nerve in some cases, because it just gets around and it innervates multiple places where some of your nerves, a lot of your nerves are just a little bit more specific. Like I go to the eye or I go to the mouth or I go to this muscle. And this nerve innervates, innervates mean it has nerve endings that connect with, so it connects to these areas of the body being your facial muscles, your eyes, your vocal cords, your inner ear, your heart, your lungs, and all of the digestive organs in your abdomen. There's a whole lot of places for a nerve to go, isn't it? Literally connects with your face, your heart, your lungs, everything in your chest and your stomach, all the stuff in your tummy. That is a lot of places for a nerve to wander. So that's why it's called the vagabond or the wanderlust nerve. Now, your vagus nerve is the second longest nerve in your body. The first, the longest nerve of your body is actually your sciatica. And the vagus nerve is the second longest. So it's a very long nerve, gets around to a lot of places. I mean, your sciatic nerve is way longer. Well, maybe not way longer, but it's considerably longer. But your sciatic nerve doesn't innervate all these places like your spleen and your left lung and your larynx. So we can see how special and unique the vagus nerve is because of all of its touch points. Now the vagus nerve is actually not one nerve. It is a whole bunch of nerves. So it's a bundle of nerves. And those nerves are often considered to be the mind-body connection because your vagus nerve has something called afferent and efferent nerve endings. What does that mean, Rebecca? So afferent, body to brain, efferent brain to body. I sometimes keep that straight by thinking of efferent as exit, so exit brain. I don't know. Take it or leave it. That's how I keep that straight. So afferent, body to brain, efferent, brain to body. So this nerve has these bi-directional nerves in it, so it is the mind-body connection. It carries information from the brain to the body and from the body to the brain. The vagus nerve, because it innervates so many places in your body, can have a huge effect on how you're physically and emotionally feeling. And your vagus nerve has a big role in managing and mediating your stress responses. So your vagus nerve works as a pacemaker on your heart. There are kind of two mechanisms that work as a pacemaker on your heart, and the vagus nerve is one of them. And so the vagus nerve is very reactive and responsive to things that your brain perceives to be dangerous or threatening. 
And when your brain perceives something to be dangerous or threatening, like you're on a walk in a park and all of a sudden you come upon something and your brain perceives it to be a snake <gasps> and your brain perceives, oh my gosh, snake. And it immediately sends your body into reaction. So maybe you jump back or maybe you freeze. You don't step forward because you're about to step on said potential snake or you scream or you startle or maybe you are somebody and you like, I love snakes. I have like 20 of them and snakes don't scare me. So your brain does not perceive that to be dangerous. And so you don't have a stress response. But if you did perceive it to be scary and potentially dangerous, your brain would cue your vagus nerve to move your entire neurobiology into kind of this defensive reactive state. And it does so by influencing your heart. And so when the vagus nerve cues your heart to beat faster, to speed up, this is when we move into fight or flight states. So think about if you're in fight or flight, a stress response, your brain perceives something to be really dangerous and you need to fight or you need to flee and run away, you need your heart rate to be pretty fast, right? Like you need a fast heart rate, you need your blood pressure to kick up, you need your breathing to increase your respiration to increase. You need a lot of muscle tension probably to fight said predator off or run away from scary thing. And when all of that happens, so it's kind of like a domino effect. So your body moves into fight or flight by that vagus nerve kicking your ticker into overdrive. And when your ticker gets kicked into overdrive because you think something is scary and your heart rate follows suit, your blood pressure follows suit, your muscles get tense, your digestion changes as well. So when we're in fight or flight, our digestion tends to get suppressed. Like you're not super hungry when you're trying to fight off an attacker in the middle of maybe fleeing something dangerous. You're not like, you know, I need to stop for a turkey sandwich about now. No, you tend to kind of not be hungry. You might lose your appetite completely. This is where sometimes people lose weight when they're chronically stressed out because you're just not hungry. Your digestion gets all weird and wonky. Your immune system can get depressed here too. You know, like why maybe you don't get sick when you're really stressed, but you get sick like right afterwards because your immune system just like wasn't able to monitor that there was something that even needed to be attacked in your body. It was kind of like on repressed. It was on timeout. It was on the bench because other things were taking the metabolic needs of your body, all the resources. Now, emotionally, when we go into fight or flight, you know what that feels like. It feels great. Uh, no, fight or flight sucks emotionally, right? You feel stressed. You feel panic. You feel fear. You might have racing thoughts. You might be ruminating. You might be obsessing. You're like hashing out that conversation a bazillion times and being hard on yourself of what you should have said differently. And did I say the right thing? You're like rereading that email a million times. And um, you're probably not getting great sleep because you're rereading said email multiple times in the middle of the night. And it's hard to pay attention. It's hard to concentrate. All of a sudden you get into arguments with your partner because you're not a good listener, because your mind is so distracted, because you're thinking about said email or said conversation. <sighs> yeah, fight or flight responses are tough. They're like mobilizing. In fact, that is exactly what your nervous system is trying to do and your vagus nerve is doing when it's responding to said scary thing, to said snake on the trail. It is mobilizing you into action. So your vagus nerve makes that possible. It is kind of the, the first domino that leads to all of those other things happening. Now, your vagus nerve also has the capacity to move you into kind of what's called a dorsal state or an immobilization state. And this is where we kind of collapse inside. We might even completely faint. So fainting goats, when they pass out, because they get startled and scared, made possible by their vagus nerve. So when, let's say you are mm, completely overwhelmed with a situation, you've been stuck in fight or flight responses for quite a while, and your brain has finally decided that there is no hope, there's no way to flee or fight off said situation, and you go into kind of this collapse inside. It's like the the meter was like at full, full kick it into gear kind of mode, like redlining. And then all of a sudden you just lost all your energy. You collapsed inside, like everything just shut down. 
So the vagus nerve also can have an effect on the heart that puts us into like this state of collapse. And when we move into a state of collapse, we kind of have the opposite neurophysiological things happen to our body from that fight or flight state. So when we go into that collapse state, we tend to feel really lethargic, we might feel really tired, like we just really lack energy. Our heart rate might be kind of chronically beating too slow. Our blood pressure might be too slow. Our breathing is maybe really slow. It's probably not super deep, but it's not, it's not like still not a healthy breath pattern, I would say. In this state, our body goes into usually trying to conserve resources. So it tries to conserve calories. And this is where we might get a lot of cravings. We might put on weight. We might find that we're constantly hungry. We're always snacking. We might really struggle to maintain our relationships, lose interest in relationships in these places. And our body just feels like we're buried under a ton of rocks. In this dorsal collapse state, this is where we feel depressed. We might feel hopeless. It might be hard to feel our body. We feel kind of dissociated and checked out. We feel a lot of despair. Sometimes we might feel buried under shame here. And so that state is also partially made possible by the functioning of the vagus nerve. I say partially because all of these stress responses require a whole lot of things happening in your neurobiology. And it's not simply the vagus nerve that is like the culprit of all of it. There's a number of things that are happening, but the vagus nerve has a really significant role on all of it. Now, when we feel balanced, when we're in a good state, when our vagus nerve is stimulated and toned and is healthy, we can feel the state of ease and peace and joy and happiness. We have like the right balance of energy. Our digestion is working. Our immune system is working well. You know, we're not chronically tensed in our body unless like you just had a really hard workout or you went for a really hard run or you just moved and your muscles are all pulled and strained because of carrying a couch. You can form relationships, you can engage in relationships, you're curious, you can learn your best here. And this sometimes we refer to as the window of tolerance in the field of psychotherapy and counseling. The window of tolerance is like the optimal zone, I would say. And it's it's where it's not that everything is cush and you're just comfortable all the time, but it's where your neurobiology is supported in a way that you can manage the stressors and the hard stuff that happens in life. And you're functioning kind of in your optimal zone. So the window of tolerance is where thriving happens. If you're thriving, you probably have a really solid window of tolerance. And that means that your neurobiology is kind of functioning at an optimal level. And partly that's made possible because of how toned and resilient your vagus nerve is. So Rebecca, you keep saying toned, like what the heck is a toned vagus nerve? So, you know, if you wanted to tone your biceps, you probably got to go lift some weights. You can't be like, grow bicep. I want to tone bicep. Go and just like will it into existence. You have to like do some things. You have to exercise to tone that muscle. And then you get the bicep you want or the abs you want or right the hamstrings or whatever that is, right? So you got to exercise to tone your body. And so your nervous system is kind of the same. And so we have to tone our vagus nerve. You can absolutely use exercises to exercise your vagus nerve, to tone your vagus nerve. And a toned vagus nerve ultimately gives you access to more health and wealth in your life. It allows you to better regulate your stress responses. When we don't have a very toned vagus nerve, when we walk upon said potential snake on trail in woods and we startle, even if it wasn't a snake, we might be startled for the rest of the day. Or when we have an upsetting conversation with a friend, that conversation stays with us for days. We ruminate about it. We can't get to sleep at night. When we don't have a toned vagus nerve, we can't move out of those states of depression and collapse. We can't get out of anxious states. We can't get out of immobilized or mobilized states. Like we get stuck in these states of neurobiology because your nervous system is just reacting. It's just reacting to stimuli that you're coming into contact with. But when your vagus nerve is toned and you recognize said snake, it was just a stick. It's not actually a snake. You can take a deep breath, get regulated and move on with your day and it's over. Or the frustrating conversation you had with a friend maybe is still like on your mind, but it's not taking up all of your real estate for the day. 
Or when you feel really sad and down and depressed, you're able to use some skills to move out of said state of sadness and depression. So a toned vagus nerve is an absolutely amazing resource to have as you're trying to thrive and grow in your life. When we don't have a toned vagus nerve, things just tend to be a little suckier and a little harder. So your vagus nerve, very important for moving out of stress states, for having more resiliency, for building that window of tolerance, for just navigating the hardships of life with more ease and resiliency, and ultimately allowing you to thrive. So how the heck do you tone your vagus nerve? Well, you got to exercise it. And there's lots of things that you can do to exercise your vagus nerve from actual physical activities to emotional activities to even religion and spirituality and prayer. I mean, there is a host of things you can do to tone your vagus nerve. So I am not going to be able to go over all of those in this podcast, but I'll give you a couple of helpful tips and things you can try. So one way to tone your vagus nerve is with cold water therapy. And maybe you've heard of cold water therapy before. Um, I use cold water therapy when I'm in the shower in the morning, but cold water therapy is absolutely a way to tone your vagus nerve. So you can splash cold water on your face. You can turn your shower to cold, maybe the last 60 seconds of your shower, fill your bathtub up with cold water, get a cold plunge, or you can even seek out a cryo chamber. So there's these things called cryo chambers that some wellness centers have. I've tried them before. They're pretty cool. Um, I like cryo chambers better than some forms of cold water therapy because they don't hurt. Where if you're in cold water for a while, it starts to actually kind of hurt your skin and your body. So the reason that cold water therapy works, I I won't get into all the science of it just for timing's sake, but when you splash cold water on your face or you turn your shower to cold or you step into a cryo chamber, there's this quick kind of cold reflex, this cold response, this (gasps) you kind of gasp and your heart rate (gasps) kind of kicks up. And that moment that your heart rate goes (gasps) and kicks up and you gasp is your vagus nerve getting stimulated and engaging. And so that is, that's one way I get through cold water therapy in the shower in the morning is I tell myself the gasp is what I want to happen because it's good for my neurobiology, even though like I can't stand it really. So cold water therapy is a great way to tone your vagus nerve. Exercise, getting movement, getting your heart rate up during the day. You can almost think of virtually almost any activity that increases or decreases your heart rate, that allows you to practice increasing or decreasing heart rate is one way to tone and stimulate your vagus nerve. Because to increase and decrease your heart rate, your vagus nerve has to play a role. So getting up and going for a walk during the day or getting to the gym or getting on the treadmill or even just like doing some jumping jacks is a way to stimulate your vagus nerve because you had to increase your heart rate to be able to do said exercise. Mindfulness is also a great way to tone your vagus nerve. So practicing mindfulness is about being present in the moment, coming back to the here and now, maybe focusing on your breath or a mantra that you repeat in your mind, or listening to a guided visualization. Now, mindfulness and meditation are not necessarily one and the same. So when you're practicing meditation, you are absolutely practicing mindfulness. But just because you're practicing mindfulness doesn't mean that you're meditating. So for example, you can practice mindful eating. And mindful eating is about really being present with your food, like not being on your phone or watching TV or involved in a conversation while you're eating, and really being present with kind of all the sensory stimuli that comes along with eating from the smell of the food to the taste of the food to the texture to like really slowly chewing and swallowing things, really allowing yourself to be fully present with the experience of consuming a meal. That's one way you can practice mindfulness. You can practice mindfulness by just taking some time during the day to do some mindful sitting or you get away from your gadgets and you just try and really be present and notice all the stimuli around you in your environment and just focus on your breath and trying to clear your mind. Focus your mind on just right here, right now, instead of the email that you just sent or the conversation you have to have or the chores you have to do later. So mindfulness is a great way to tone your vagus nerve as well. Nature is also an incredible way to tone your vagus nerve. Our nervous systems love nature love, love, love nature. So taking time to get outdoors, to sit in a park, to go for a walk, to go for a hike, hike, to just sit in your backyard, listening to the birds and noticing the trees and the flowers and all that 
also a wonderful way to stimulate and tone your vagus nerve. Relationships can also be very stimulating and good for the vagus nerve. They can also be really terrible for the vagus nerve, depending on said quality of relationship. Uh, Relationships can be the best thing for us or the worst thing for us. So when you want to tone and stimulate your vagus nerve and exercise it, social interaction can be a wonderful pathway to doing so. Whether that's interacting with an animal or with a person who is safe and kind and compassionate and loving is going to be good for your neurobiology. Prayer is also shown to be a way to tone your vagus nerve. So whether you are praying to God or to the universe or you're just talking to God or maybe to ancestors beyond or loved ones, finding some way to connect to your spiritual practice also is shown to have a toning and stimulating effect on the vagus nerve. Other things like yoga, tai chi, qigong, Uh, mindful breathing, breathing techniques and practices, even some supplements. These are all things that are shown to help tone and strengthen the vagus nerve. And again, when we tone and strengthen and stimulate our vagus nerve, we're essentially increasing that nerve's ability to dampen stress responses when we want to dampen them. So that when you come upon said snake in the woods, you can thwart that response, that stress response that you originally had to it. Or when you have an argument with your partner or with your friend, you're able to calm your neurobiology so you don't say things that make it worse. And maybe you can actually find some compassion, even if they're being an asshole. So a toned vagus nerve is just an amazing resource to have in this life because, gosh, if we could all get a better handle on our stress responses, can you imagine what the world could be like for yourself and others? We would be less likely to have people flipping each other off and calling each other names on the highway when they're in rush hour traffic. And people would just be a little kinder and nicer to each other when you're having a hard day. And maybe nations wouldn't be so quick to go to war or drop bombs on each other. Hmm. If we all had more toned vagus nerves, we ultimately would have better lives, more opportunities to thrive, and we'd have more functional societies. Now, while we can't go poof and make every human in this world on this planet have a more toned vagus nerve, it all starts with you. And so the more you can work on toning your vagus nerve and getting a hold of those stress responses, the more capacity and opportunities you will have to thrive in your life. And the more opportunities you have to thrive directly correlate to how much other people can thrive. Because when we're doing well, when we're thriving, other people are like, what does she have going on? Let me get some of that. You inspire people. You show people by example what it's like to thrive, what it's like to live a compassionate life life, to be kind to people, including yourself, including your enemies. And we share that wealth of neurobiological resources and resiliency that we've been building in our own cellular body with everyone and everything around us. When you thrive, other people thrive. When you thrive, your dog thrives. When you thrive, your kid thrives. When you thrive, your societies and your communities thrive. So think about while it may start with something so small but so mighty as your powerful wanderlust vagabond of a nerve, the vagus nerve. It has huge implications for not only your own level of resiliency each and every day, But all of that resiliency, all of that Thrive Vibe energy spills out and upon everyone and everything around you. So if you don't want to tone your vagus nerve for yourself next time you're in the shower, think about this cold water therapy I'm about to do for 30 seconds. It's for my kid. It's not for me. So get to toning that vagus nerve. Go ahead and Google how to tone your vagus nerve. There is a wealth of information out there on the internet. Just be careful because not all of it is accurate. So be careful if something sounds super strange, like is it backed by any kind of scientific research? Because there's some weird stuff out there that is not actually going to tone your vagus nerve. But you can really think about what would that do to my heart rate? Would that increase or decrease my heart rate with intentionality? So get to toning that vagus nerve. Get to exercise in that vagabond and may you have a wealth of health in your life and may you thrive. Bye. Thank you for joining us on another episode of Thrive the Podcast. I hope these insights inspire positive changes in your life. 
If you're ready to take the next step in your Thrive journey, check out goodies linked in the show notes and on my website, rebeccacase.com. Sign up for my newsletter and get access to helpful resources, connect with my community, and be the first to know about events and happenings. Remember, your journey from surviving to thriving is unique and you have the power to create your best life. Subscribe, share, and thrive into your potential. Until next time, this is Rebecca Case, signing off. Thrive on.